Now welcome to another news from Naboo with Thor's Lightning Takes. Mm. <laughs> Let's get right to the news. We're going to talk about Diego Luna sharing kind of like his excitement over Andor Season 2 scripts, discussing Cassian's relationship with Marva and more. Today's article is coming through Star Wars News Net and an interview Diego Luna did with Collider. We know the Andor team is currently hard at work filming Season 2 in the UK, but there's press tours wrapping up, so we're still getting interviews and quotes from people involved. Diego Luna kind of spoke about whether he thinks Cassian is familiar with, with lightsabers and Jedi, his initial thoughts on new scripts. But we'll start with he revealed his reaction when he first got the call from Lucasfilm about the series, and then all the questions that came with the reveal of the project. In, it's funny, he says he kind of had the same reaction as he did when they t- announced Rogue One and that he was <laughs> for it. He says... In Rogue One, we had the same kind of feeling. It was like, the first reaction was, really? What? We're going to do what? Now you're going to do a film that was the beginning and an, and an end in the cast? There are no Jedi. What do you mean? I mean, is the tone going to be different? He goes, I have the same reaction when I was offered Cassian for Andor. I was like, what? What do you mean? Really? Me for this? What makes you think it'll be good for this show? So I think I understand, and to be honest, it took a little pressure off our shoulders to come out of nowhere. My reaction on this journey since the series came out, I think it's very important for people, for audiences, to be able to watch the first three episodes in one because it gave you a feeling of what we were trying to achieve in the range of what this show was going to offer. And that's true. The first three episodes all paired together were perfect. You really got a full scope of what an arc of this show feels like with the, it's like the a mini slow movie, burns dude. and the payoff. Yeah, when you watch it all at once, it's like a it's like a movie. Yes, it was absolutely, I think, important to view it that way. Yeah, they would, they would have, have done an episode by episode. Mistake. They could have very easily turned off a huge, huge mistake releasing just that face. first episode. Mm-hmm. Even the first two, like they're doing on TV, but yeah. thankfully they're relying on word of mouth at this point too. Yeah, which hopefully is is doing and if something. It's coming on TV, most likely someone's told you to watch it. Maybe a certain YouTuber who made a video <laughs> video about it. Maybe. Maybe. But according to him, everything went great with Andor's kickoff, not just because of great reviews, but because they were able to deliver exactly what they set out to do. He says, You know what's beautiful? That when I hear people talking about the show on social media, when I read their reviews, I hear a lot of them using words that we reminded ourselves of every day on set. The darkness, the complexity, the depth, the intimacy, the realism. I think that's one thing Tony and we were all trying to remind ourselves, that this has to feel real. This has to feel real. It has to give you the opportunity to forget you're in a galaxy far, far away for a second. It has to feel like you're witnessing an intimate, realistic moment of someone close to your community, that you're spying on your neighbors kind of thing. I think that's what it does really well. It does, it's the most, and again, this is not a, you know, a knock against other Star Wars. I obviously love other Star Wars. But it is the most realistic feeling Star Wars, the most grounded mm-hmm. feeling Star Wars. Absolutely. And he's right. It does feel like we're we're spying through the wall on a piece of somebody's intimate life. Yeah, exactly. Because everything feels too real to be contrived. No one's putting on a show. It's These are real people. And, and to go with what he was saying before about, you know, really, me, no Jedi, that kind of thing, I think... I think that's almost a good thing because I think it lowers expectations and not in, again, a negative way, not like, oh, who cares, I'm not expecting anything from this. But, you know, when you say the name Kenobi, when you say the name Boba Fett, expectations go through the roof. Mm -hmm. And when you say the name Andor, well, you're like, oh, okay, a lot of people will say I don't really care about the character, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But then you have people, you know, who will watch and are curious and come to really appreciate the character, right? Because you're not expecting anything and then you get something and it's a, a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. In the first scene of the first episode, we were introduced to what we thought would be like a significant character conflict for Cassian over the season, you know, looking for his sister. And then that was only brought up like one more time throughout the season. And they kind of asked if the character has stopped looking for her. And Diego Luna replied, I don't think it's over. I don't think it's ever over. I don't think it's over in Rogue One because I see that as one thing. It's like the feeling, it's one of those things that kind of follow every decision you make or never letting go anymore, not again. He kind of is relating this to Marva as well. That kind of, he says, you know, that kind of thing. And I think that's behind the decision of the last mission, that suicide mission in Rogue One. That's for her. That's for Marva. That's for his people, for his community. 
I love the arc that Tony has built, the arc that ends in Rogue One, not in Season 2. I think it's going to be quite amazing to watch Rogue One after you see Season 2. I think you'll see a different film. For sure, you'll understand the character from a different perspective, and you'll be with him in a different way. I think we'd already see a different film. Well, we watched it right before. Mm-hmm. I mean, like the days, a couple days before. So it's kind yeah. of a, really fresh in my mind. And I'm already like, wow, that film just kind of is going to feel a whole lot different. I never connected with Cassian very well in Rogue I One. I mean, I, I, thought, did, you know, I, no. I connected more with Jin. She seemed to be more the main character, the one yeah. you're supposed to be following on the emotional trip. Adding all this depth to Cassian is amazing yeah. because I see him now. I really notice who he is. And it's uh, interesting to note that he says he doesn't think the search is over in Rogue One, which I don't know if he intended to say that as much, you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. that is a, it's kind of a massive spoiler in a way. Right, it's telling us he's never finding her. So he may have just kind of casually said this is just something that's always with him, not necessarily trying to confirm that we won't find her in season two, but probably won't find her mm-hmm. in season two. That's what I think. I think it's just something that's going to maybe go away. But I like that the way he responded to the fact that he says that Rogue One is the end of their story. Season 2 is not the end of their story. Season 2 leads into Rogue One, and that is the completion of the story. Luna was also asked if he thinks Cassian and the rest of his community in Ferrix have heard about the Jedi Order or lightsabers. He apparently looked kind of dubious, and then Collider told him that Tony Gilroy had said that they had not heard of any of them. How is this a thing in the Star Wars galaxy? (laughs) A small community, maybe they just don't believe anymore? But it's like 15 years ago. I'd be like not believing in something that happened in like 2008. I mean, think about that in perspective. Like if we, if there was some major, you know, conflict here on Earth, right? That maybe you weren't a part of and it was distant. Say like the Clone Wars might be distant for them. You probably would have still heard of it. You probably would know who fought on each side, right? I don't know. To me, that's a very strange thing. And I'm not saying that nobody in the galaxy, you know... He might have just been doing, like, a blanket cover because he doesn't use them in his story, saying, sure, they haven't heard of them. Well, it's just... I mean, it might be that they have, but they don't talk about it. Well, that's fine, but you should at least have heard of them. I mean, unless you're in an isolated part of the galaxy, I'm not saying saying everybody would have heard of them, right? But if you're in the fight, if you are a, a rebel and you know kind of the Empire's story... You know, you're probably curious where they came from 15 years ago. You probably know they came out of the Clone Wars, that the Republic turned into them, that there used to be the Jedi. I don't know. I think it's kind of strange. Yeah, it also depends on what kind of campaign they uh, they ran afterwards. Even still, like you can't, you know, erase people's minds. You can't erase people randomly remembering 15 years ago. Like it would be impossible. It would be virtually impossible to erase something that happened 15 years ago in our world, right? I mean, that that was widely known. That was, like, an impacting the entire world. But on to what Diego Luna said. Sorry, that, that, it's one of my things. It comes out of the Mandalorian, how, like, Cara Dune didn't seem to know who Luke Skywalker was, even though she was in the Rebel Alliance. It's it's one of those things that I'm like, really? You, you didn't know that? It's like not knowing who General Patton was in, in World War II in your in well, a U.S. soldier. I know of him, but I didn't know him. Well, there, there's a good example, right? You're not a you're not a history buff in World War II, but you you've heard that name, at least. Anyway... I'll, I'll, I'll let it drop. Thank you. <laughs> he said, I agree, at least from what we see, he doesn't know and clearly doesn't believe in that. Even if he had heard of them, he clearly doesn't believe in them. So he's leaving the door open. Okay. But I don't think they've even heard of that. No. We'll see the second season. I still think it's strange. But I will, I'll, but I'll just, just let it drop. But that last sentence there, we'll see in the second season. Yeah, there's there's going to be something in the second season, right? I, I, mean, I expect more fan service moments. hinted at le- legacy characters yeah. coming in. More fan service moments out of necessity. Could we see Ahsoka? Potentially. Why not? She is a Fulcrum agent working yeah, I don't, with the I don't Rebellion. Have a problem. I don't have a problem with that. With Bale, the Ghost crew, if they show up, I mean, we could see... A Kanan, an, Ez- yeah. you know, an Ezra. Well, we know Mon Mothma's kind of escape from, you know, the Senate escape from Coruscant goes through, you know, Rebels. And it's already been set up crew. with the Gorman, so... Yeah, and as she I'm, meets Ezra. Yeah, as I'm saying, there might be some necessity fan service moments in Season 2. Not not in there just to be blatant, but because, well, if we're going to tell Mon Mothma's story, we got to tell her, we got to tell how she escaped and that the, the Ghost crew helped her, right? Well, yeah. I mean, you don't have to show it, but you can no, at, but least you can at least make mention, mention of it. you know... A little bit. You don't have to go into the detail because the detail already exists. So you don't have to show it twice, in a way. Yeah. 
You can just say yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. You know, you can, you know, kind of almost reference that episode by mentioning the ghost crew, you know, this mm-hmm. whatever it is. Luna was also asked whether Cassian's final turn came after his experience inside the prison or after listening to Marva's speech. We finally turned into Cassian, you know, Cassian yeah. that we are more familiar with. <laughs> I mean, he was more. always Cassian, but yeah, the, the guy we see in Rogue One, more or less. To him, it was both. He said, I think it's both. The prison is about, he realizes how effed up things are in his galaxy. He realizes how little the life of people mean to the Empire. What you are to the Empire is an effing white suit, a number. And you just mean something if you produce just a number. You're a white suit. There's no personality there. He realizes that the prison is just a metaphor of life out there. You don't have to be in that prison to be living in a prison. I think that jump, that running out, that one way out sequence, is definitely a first time he's running away with a purpose. Because he keeps running away in this show. He's always running away. He starts running away. But there's a moment where he knows why he's running away. And that something has to be done. That he can't call that life. But I think Marva, in a personal way, is what ends up setting him up. It's the wake-up call, and it arrives too late. He just realizes that he always had it there, that the mentor, that the referent, the example, it was there, it was at home, it was sitting there in that chair, that the words that she was saying were true. That's why I was saying that Rogue One will feel different after watching episode 12 because you remember Marva with every word Cassian says and every action he does. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, like we were saying before, we watched Rogue One right before the series started, so this is very fresh, and yeah, just every... It was kind of nice watching and or remembering Rogue One so clearly because you could kind of see the pieces, you know, the pregame pieces, if you will, to Rogue One lining up and making sense for the character. How tragic for him, though, that he didn't realize the things he was running away from, the things he's starting to run to, were his mother. Yeah. He, I mean, his, his, his mom, all of her words, everything she said, her fight to stand up, her drive. Those are things he shrugged off, he abandoned. Yeah. It gets thrown back into his face in that last episode, and he realizes, you know, that's, I mean, it's, that's part of his loss. Yeah, I'm sure he's going to wish he could tell her. You know, what I, he's done, I what carried he's on your flame, your torch, whatever you want to call it. And I'm fighting for you. I'm fighting for the cause you believed in. And I wonder now what he feels regarding that Althani mission. Does he feel shame or, or pride? Pride knowing he did something to help the rebellion, but shame because he knows all those gritty details involved and that he wasn't in it for the cause. I, I think he doesn't. I mean, we know Cassian's going to be, he's, he is just for the cause, right? He, it, it's kind of funny because he talks about how he realizes that to the, to the Empire, the people of the galaxy are nothing. Mm-hmm. Yet also, to an extent, which is the great irony of the show, is he has to look at certain people as cogs in the wheel of the rebellion mm-hmm. that are expendable. I mean, the, ga- the guy he shoots at the start of Rogue One, for example. There are certainly other things. He was going to assassinate Galen Erso. You know, so there are, there are things he is willing to do that kind of put him into that same bracket where he is looking at people not as people, but as a means to an end or... You know, something along those lines. I just really want to know what he feels about what he's done in the Eldhani mission, though. I Does he look back at that as a moment of pride of, I stuck it to the Empire? Or because he knows he wasn't in it for the cause? And because he knows... Oh, I see what you're saying. I, I thought you because were asking that, if you um, thought he would have any regret over no. the details and how Or that he, the other guy wasn't in it for the cause and he ended up killing him. Yeah. I, I don't think there's... That's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean, it's like looking back at something and realizing you did something fantastic, but, not for but the you right didn't reason. do it for the right reason. Yeah. And all of the, the grittiness involved means that something, you know, dark things could have happened. Yeah. He might even know on some level what Cynthia most likely did. Well, I'm oh, sure she, it was part of the plan, it. right? You know she did it because she went and stalked that ISB guy yeah. when they were trying to, you know, Val's like, oh, we're going, we're leaving, we're getting out of here. She still took the time to go and, you know, like slaughter that guy. Yeah. I think it's very much implied that she did what needed to be done there. She seems like a different person after there. I mean, yeah. before then, she and Val were very close. and She seems to be drifting she's further. She's very drifting because she's doing these dark things. I yeah. think that's a guarantee that she did it now. Well, when you, it's hard to let someone love you when you don't love what you are, right? Mm-hmm. 
I mean, that's she. Well, she's turning into all revenge have, yeah. and anger and despair. Yeah, if you have any any markum of decency within you, you you know what you're doing is wrong. It might be for the right reasons. We could get into a really interesting moral discussion, but mm-hmm. you, she has to be aware of the fact that what she is doing is dark and that she is not quote unquote lovable for these things, right? Right. And so it's push Vel away because you you can't love me. You shouldn't love what I am. On that note. <laughs> yeah, like I said, you could always I could always ramble on if you want, but for now I think um, that's all we got for you this time. So do take to the comments below. Tell us what you think of any and all of today's news. Tell us what you think of what Tony Gilroy and Diego Luna had to say here. Mainly Diego Luna, I should say. We actually didn't talk too much about Gilroy for a change. Either way, leave those comments below. Let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.